Another one from my time in the scouts. 18 at the time. Taking 8, 9 to 10 year old scouts on a two night camping trip up a rather small mountain. Had another 18 year old scout to help out. The trail is easy but unpopular. It's in a backwoods area that isn't heavily trafficked. First day hike up seeing no one. Make camp. We're pretty far up the trail and have a clear line of sight downwards in the direction we came from. We cook and everyone goes to sleep. Except for me. I set up a hammock away from the tents in some trees to read a book. It's 10.30 and I decide to call it a night. Turn off my light and enjoy the moonlit silence. That's when I notice a silhouette of a man coming up the trail. He has no lights on. Have a bad feeling about it. Observe him as he walks up the trail. Then he notices our camp. He then just stands there and stares at the tents. Stood there for a good 10 minutes. Then he moves back into the trees. Takes off his pack and sits. Still staring at our camp. I'm laying there observing him the whole time ready to alert the scouts if he moves to close. At about 3.30 am he gets up again. Stands and stares at the tents. After a few minutes, he turns around and walks back down the trail where he came from. Stay in my hammock keeping watch until sunrise. In the morning, tell the other older scout what happened. We agree to head back immediately. I still wonder what the fuck he was thinking about doing. This one happened in January, right after New Year's. Be leaving Illinois for my home in Pennsylvania. Was there visiting kinfolk for the holidays. 15 to 16 hour drive, didn't leave till late, planned on stopping at a motel. About 7 hours in, the urge to sleep gets strong. Pull into a small roadside stop. Go to check in, realize I left my wallet in Illinois. Shit fuck damn it. Lady behind the counter says there's an old campground up the road. Says to be careful though, nobody goes up there but she's heard stories. Ask her what kind of stories local legends, you know. Mostly I think it's just meth heads. I agree, since I'm still in the Bible Belt at this point. Middle America has a bad meth issue. Take her instructions, find the campground. It was a pretty warm winter in the area so there's only a little snow on the ground, so the going isn't too bad down the dirt road to get in. Find the check-in office, lady wasn't kidding when she said the place didn't get much use. Building's windows are all either gone or boarded up. Decide to park behind it just in case cops. Already feeling sketched out by the situation, I decide to risk getting my concealed carry gun out of the spare tire area and load it, keep it gripped out under the back of the driver's seat, since I'm gonna sleep in the back seat. Put my mallite on the seat next to me, grab my blanket and pillow and lay across the back seat, facing the window that looks out into the woods. Leave the windows cracked so I don't die. Fall into fitful sleep, wake up maybe two hours later with a god-awful smell. Smells like a mix of roadkill, vomit, and dookies. Oh sweet Jesus I'm gonna hurl. It's a big clearing and a pretty clear night, so I notice something standing at the far end of the campground. Think it's maybe a tweaker and the smell is coming from him, so grab the mallite and shine it out at this guy. Thing suddenly stands the rest of the way up. Probably eight feet tall, it's too far out for me to make out any real details. Grab pistol and get ready as fuck. Can't shit my pants due to sheer, ass clenching terror. Thing makes this horrible half squeal half bark barfing noise that trundles off into a weird laugh, twitches around and then bounds into the woods. Fucking what the fuck was that fucking shit? Slowly reach for the door handle, right as I do boom. There's a huge thud on my roof. Boom 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 barfy giggle noise. Oh sweet lord Jesus please don't let me die tonight. Open the door and rock it out, stumble, fall, roll over. Shin Mollite at my car and aim the pistol. I can't see shit captain. MFW nothing's on my roof at all. Suddenly the smell is right on top of me, worse than it had been before. Jump up, almost at urine mode engaged. Swing light and gun around, stop dead. Fucking thing is like. Three inches from me, leaned down. Ain't got no face. Just a big as ragged rip that might be a grin or a grimace. Makes that horrible gurgling barf bark laugh and I probably shouted or tried to sound badass, but it probably came out pretty girly. Shut eyes tight, 
Pull the trigger until the gun clicks empty. All I can smell is burnt powder. Slowly open my eyes. The thing is gone, there's a lot of spent shells on the ground. Also I peed myself a little. Don't even wait to see where it went, just hear angry screeching from the woods. Jump in my car and speed off, almost crash, hear that noise the whole way until I make it to the highway. Don't stop for anything until I hit the paw border, and only then to change out of piss stained pants and get a candy bar. Never been so scared in my life, honestly thought I was gonna bite the big burrito. I listen to lots of scary stories on YouTube. The normies piss me off so much I don't know why I even listen, they hear a deer slash cougar scream and tell a story about how it was a demon. They see a random dude deep in the woods and immediately think they are a murderer. They think homeless people are animals that will attack OK site lol, it's pretty funny how these people freak out over such normal and boring woodland shit. Especially the females, they always try and write their stories like they are Billy Badass but each time they are scared by shit that the average lurking anon here would either ignore or not swear over. Scariest experience of my own is. Be me alone camping in woods. Been there a few weeks. Sun is going down, I have approximate. 1.5 hours or so not quite 2 to 3 but over an hour. See three guys crouching around the woods, 250 meters across the river. I naturally crouch and watch, reach for binoculars and sit very still. They seem to be hunting deer, no firearms visible but one does have a buck knife. I am spooked at this point, mind racing I think about what I should do. Run, contact, stay still. I am miles into the wild at this point, plus my belongings are all set up in a concealed slash camo camp and I can't just leave it all here to head blindly into the woods this late. My gut is telling me that they are not friendly, I don't know why but I just feel like if I speak with them it will not go well at all. I decide to stay on my spot and watch, they have come to the river now, slightly closer but there is no way they could see my camp as it was uphill in a strange spot, hidden between brush and trees, the land is shaped in such a way that you would have to be right on me to see me. It's getting dark now, they still are not using a light and are moving slow slash looking around a lot. They split into three and I lose sight of one, but he walked away from me whilst the other two cross the river and split. One is going the opposite direction one is heading towards me, one is heading down river. I slowly move behind some brush and back off another 100 meters or so. Lie down and continue watching. My stomach drops. I found you bitch these are our woods. The one that was heading closer has found my camp, this is when I confirm that they are looking for me I don't know why or how I have done nothing to warrant this, didn't even know the land was owned it was so remote. No dead animals, no trash, no wildfires etc. I can hear my things being thrown around now and a pretty loud conversation as they all have regrouped in my camp. Can't understand them but they seem to be angry, occasional screaming and such into the woods around them saying things like we know you're here boy, you're done another than sticks in my mind is I'm gonna have fun skinning you. I lie still in terror. True story continue. About 30 minutes pass but it could have been more slash less it's hard to tell at this point, it's getting really dark now and I see them heading back downhill and still hear them shouting in the distance. I lay still in the woods for another 20 to 30 minutes and thank god I did, not sure how much longer I would have lay there but I wasn't eager to move since I knew that they knew where my camp was, but I didn't know where they were. A fucking flashlight turns on at my camp. If you're out here, you should call yourself lucky from now on, don't ever come back here boy. Deal.jpg. I lay and watch the flashlight go into the distance, it's pitch black now so I give it another 20 minutes in case it was some kind of double trap. Nothing but silence, after a while I hear gunshots a few miles away, across the river where they headed earlier. At this point I just slowly approached my camp, gathered my gear as best as I could in speed, much was lost forever into the woods or possibly stolen, likely both. My tent is slashed apart, my sleeping bag sliced into bits with the insulation thrown around camp. 
My tarp has been pulled out of the tree and slashed up, cords cut. Gunshots again but they are much closer this time. I grab what I can and haul ass uphill. Spend the entire night moving north through the woods until I finally found a service road to follow. Followed it in the tree line just in case and was freaking out the entire night. Never went back to those woods, this took place in the southern remote US. Still don't know what they wanted, or how they found me or knew where I was. My guess is trail cams or that they found my camp earlier and came back looking for it as a group to teach me a lesson or worse. What's a trail cam? Cool story. Hunting cameras set up that look like trees or are fastened to trees, they are often obvious but the woods are so vast that I could very easily walk right by one multiple times, triggering it to record me which would then alert them that there is a man in the area. I believe they had tracked me somehow, or recorded me with hidden tech and were looking for my camp. Either that or they stumbled upon my camp earlier in the day and came back for me at night time, when they thought I would be at camp or asleep in the tent, which they were correct about. Luckily I wasn't sat by a fire cooking, or resting in my tent and was wandering the vicinity scouting the land and searching for firewood and generally anything else that I thought may be useful. My camp was a tarp between two trees, under the tarp was a tent, in front of the tent was a stone circle I had been using to build fires within, a small chest with items in it and some other miscellaneous belongings laid around in an orderly manner. Everything was camouflaged or hidden within camouflage cover slash the land. The shelter also had dead branches and leaves rested over it, would have been very difficult to find me, even if you were looking for me as a squad. The exact piece of land was incredibly awkward to get to, couldn't be seen even from uphill it was a wonderful spot and makes it all the scarier that they found me. We've never spoken about this particular event, not even among ourselves, after it happened. It was my friends Ben and Ryan, and me, going camping into the woods, like we used to do when we get a weekend off. Or at least used to, before this. In general, we try to go to new places. There was this one forest in particular, situated two hours away from our city, that we'd been told about. We had been putting it off for a while because it was said to be dangerous, packed with wild animals that would attack campers often. Ben, in his usual part of trying to be badass, said he'd take his shotgun and that we'd be safe. Ryan was a bit of a wimp, but he agreed, so we drove there as soon as we had a free weekend. We got there by mid-afternoon. After we set up camp and the night was beginning to set in, we decided to go for a walk. We secured our stuff, Ben took his shotgun, in case any animals approached us, and we started following a small path that got deeper into the woods. Walks in the dark like these would always relax me, but this time I was starting to feel uneasy, something was off. After about half an hour of walking, we started to hear noises getting closer to us. They sounded like footsteps of several, big, creatures closing in on us, but to this day I swear I could also hear soft whispers beneath the noises. Feeling like cornered animals, in total panic, we began running back through the path we had come from. During this, I somehow lost Ben and Ryan, and could not even see their flashlights in the distance, I kept on running, scared shitless. At some point, I ran past an old house which seemed to have suffered a fire, the windows were boarded up, but the door seemed half open. Suddenly, I heard something coming from the inside. Terrified at first, I froze, but then I realized it was actually Ryan, calling for me to come inside. I was doubtful at first, for some reason, but as soon as I heard the animal sounds coming closer to me, I bolted into the house and closed the door. I lifted my flashlight to look around, and there was Ryan. I pointed the light to his eyes, but he didn't seem to react much to it. In fact, he seemed really calm, which was odd for him. Let's stay here for now, he said in a relaxed tone of voice, those things out there could be dangerous. Now, I was worried about Ben, but remembered that, worst case scenario, he had his shotgun ready anything attacked him. I took a deep breath and started looking around the room. The few chairs that were laying on the floor looked charred and, in one comer of the room, there was a pile of sticks, with a bunch of stones scattered around them. All of a sudden, we heard Ben's gun go off twice. I stood there, paralyzed, as every other sound in the forest stopped. 
I glanced briefly at Ryan and he was just looking at me, completely quiet. I was about to say something when, suddenly, someone started banging on the door. Ryan immediately grabbed my shoulder and said, don't open the door, it could be one of those things. I started walking towards the door and he insisted, don't do it, they are going to kill us. This really unsettled me, but I was afraid it could be Ben, who had just shot one of the wild animals and was looking for shelter. I grabbed on the metal door handle, took a deep breath, and, as Ryan was still talking behind me, L opened the door. A cold chill ran down my spine. Standing there, in front of me, was Ryan. It didn't sink in at first, as he was saying hey man did you hear Ben's gun go off too? I think we need to find him and get the hell out of here. I babbled something incomprehensible, and slowly turned around, pointing my flashlight all over the room. Nobody was there. When the light reached the corner of the room, I realized what I had been looking at earlier, it was a pile of bones and, around them, forming a circle, were a bunch of skulls. Human skulls. We ran off as fast as we could, and found Ben near the campsite. When he saw us, he became pale and didn't say a word. We got on my truck and drove the hell away from there, leaving our shit behind. On the way back, after a long silence, I asked Ben what had he shot it. Some, things came from behind the trees and attacked me. And I shot them down. Ben, what were those things? It. It was you guys. I killed you both back there. The rest of the way back, nobody spoke a word. We never saw Ben again. So my parents used to be big outdoor buffs, my father is an ex-champion hobby boat racer and my mom was an Alabama raised country girl, so they always wanted to camp and go sailing and fishing and shit when I was little. They went on a trip with some friends of theirs when I was about 10, read as 16 years ago, and since then they refused to go camping anymore. Ever. My dad told me the story sometime after I had turned 18. It still makes me wonder, considering the following. My parents moved a lot and only had one set of friends they really kept in touch with all the times. Danny and Lisa. Danny and Lisa weren't outdoor nuts like my parents were, but they were friends and it's fun to camp with your friends, right? So they all planned like five day trip to a lake south of where we lived, with a creek that was on Danny's father's property, so they could camp on the property and fish all they wanted, then go to the lake with ease. They all left and everything from now on is from my father's account. He told me this once, and only once, and got drunk after he told me, which is extremely uncharacteristic of him anymore. The first two days were normal, just camping, drinking, sharing stories while fishing and boating and water skiing heaven. It was just young adults slash parents having fun. The second night all night everyone kept hearing weird yelps and barks, like two dogs were in a fight, but were both just hurt and yelping the whole time. They figured coyotes and slept. The next day they continued on their adventures. That night, they kept hearing those noises, but they were extremely close to the camp, so my father and Danny went out to go see if they could scare them off, while my mom and Lisa stayed behind scared out of their minds hiding in a tent, probably reading the Bible or something. Anyways, my dad and Danny went out to look for these fighting coyotes searching by following the sound. My dad had a shotgun and Danny a machete. They were hoping to scare the coyotes, or whatever they were with a gunshot. They got to a clearing and could hear the noise extremely loud, but it seemed to be from multiple directions, as if it the sounds were distant from each other. Now, my dad is a bit of a cook, swears he saw Bigfoot at 14, but this is different. He just told Danny to go back. No questions, no explanation, just Danny, we need to go back. So they did, but the sounds didn't fade away this time. Danny nervously asked my dad what was going on, but my dad wouldn't tell him, he just kept chushing him. Danny is a bit of a goofball, hence why I always liked my uncle Danny so he thought my dad was getting him back for a prank. He kept nudging my dad and trying to get him to say gotcha. But my dad never untensed. Finally they got close to the creek, a ways up from the camp and my dad told Danny to run. 
fast. Sprint. Then my dad took off, no remorse. Danny apparently followed, but tripped, and called for my dad, but my dad, who tears up and sputters a bit at this part, also uncharacteristic of him, refused to go back for him, even though Danny started calling for help. Danny was yelling that his leg was broken, it hurt, etc., but my dad just kept running. Then, my dad, my mom, and Lisa all say they heard what sounded like a really 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 fucking loud cougar growl. Imagine two lionesses going at it, amplified by 70 Marshall full stacks. That's how loud they said it was. It made my dad's ears ring. After that Danny stopped screaming for help. My dad got back to camp and the ladies asked what the fuck was going on, but my dad just said something was out there. My mom, being the practical woman she is, says well no shit, what was it? My dad wouldn't answer. Lisa is freaking out asking where Danny is, but my dad just keeps saying he'll be here in a second. A few hours pass by, and the ladies are extremely worried about Danny, while my dad apparently would cringe when they said something. Finally, from the opposite side my dad arrived from, came Danny, walking just fine up to the camp, wordlessly. My dad cocked his rifle, but waved it away as survival readiness something my mom says she won't forget, because that's what tipped her off that something was wrong. Danny first walked up and nudges his way next to my mother, but after the weird looks and the death glare from my father, moved closer to Lisa who had been nagging him for about 10 minutes, but he would either grunt yes or no, or would just stare into the fire. My dad finally asked Danny was happened to his leg, and Danny looked up confused almost. My dad told him I thought you said it was broken. Danny looked at him and replied broken. Then, as if on cue started yelling, Steve ow my leg, I think it's broken. I noped writing that part. I can just imagine it all too fucking well. The ladies grabbed medkits and first aid and water and were rationalizing it as him going into shock, but upon getting his pants off, with much difficulty as he refused to help them, and actually would make it harder for them to remove them, there was no obvious break, no blood. Just bruises all up and down his side. Lisa kept asking him what happened, but he would grunt and wave her hands away from the bruises. My dad said he's fine, let's just sleep. My mom gave him the are you fucking kidding me look and he gave her the do it woman look, that's right, old school and still working as fuck, and so she complied as he never does that, and they went to their tent. They say they heard Lisa nagging and one-sided arguing with Danny because he would never reply when she would ask him questions, which I just think is a genius wife enraging tactic, and so she finally yelled she's going to pee. Danny asked if he could come with her since there were animals out there, in not so many words. She said okay, and they left. My dad woke up about 10-ish in the morning and started making breakfast. Danny and Lisa were gone. My mom asked where they were but my dad wouldn't reply. After a little while, they both came back, rather unceremoniously, and without word. They weren't holding hands or in each other's arms, or arm over the shoulder or anything like they always were, just kind of awkwardly standing next to each other. They refused food and Danny would randomly yell out my leg and Lisa kept complaining of feeling ill. My mom suggested they go home and call off the trip on account of Danny's leg, who had not been limping at all, to my mom's horrified recollection, and the two nodded. My father just kind of watched. They all agreed, so Danny and Lisa got in my parents' car, not theirs, and just waited. Didn't pack up their tents, food, coolers, bags, anything. My mom came over and asked if they were going to grab their things and they shook their heads. My dad asked why don't you take your car? And they both said broken just like Danny had last night, in a creepy practiced way. My dad sighed and pack up the car and they drove off. Danny and Lisa stayed quiet the whole way there except for random mumblings to each other, completely indecipherable. My parents took them home and came and got me, and we could all tell something was wrong, 
besides coming back days early. They said Danny got hurt so they came home. This part on is from me now, after they all got home. I asked if we could go see them but my dad replied no a little too quickly and so I thought he was mad at me so I left to go play PlayStation. I remember cause I missed them and then he was mean. So I snuck back upstairs and listened from the stairwell, and overheard my parents and grandparents talking about how something wasn't right, it was like those stories, yada yada yada. I assumed they were talking about something random and got bored and went to go play more PlayStation. A few weeks later I asked about Uncle Danny and my dad said we're not going to see them anymore. I was mad, and so I demanded to know why. He told me something about his dad being sick and so I was sad. Then I forgot about it and life went on. Fast forward about 5 years. I'm at a supermarket where I used to live when all this happened. It was also by where Danny and Lisa lived, only on the other side of the road. Being 10 I was never allowed to go over, but now that I can drive, I decide to go see the old house, check out Danny and Lisa's house, I'm a nostalgic person, and see the only neighborhood. I'm driving slowly and rather creepishly down my old street when I spot Danny walking down the street. Excited as fuck I flag him down, pull over and get out to talk to him. He seemed stiff to me, kind of robotic I guess you could say, when he hugged me, but it was way too tight and it felt like he was trying to smother me. I asked him how he'd been and he said alright. I asked him where Lisa was and he said at home, so I asked if I could see her, and he agreed. I walked with him and asked him about all kinds of people and tried to catch up, but he didn't remember, or didn't care about 90% of it, which seemed odd, because Danny was always my awesome involved Uncle Danny. Also I'm on slash x slash so I'm automatically paranoid and shit. So I asked him a couple obvious trick questions and he failed miserably and now I'm a bit nervous. We get to his door and he opens it and the smell of a goddamned meat locker pours out, a horrid incomparable smell just assaults my nostrils. The place is a wreck, shit is just everywhere, everything is coated in dust and shit and nothing looks clean. Laundry is everywhere, no lights are really on, it's a mess. I'm more than a little freaked out and I asked what happened here, and he grunted, a really weird, almost guttural grunt. So I asked after Lisa and she yelled from the kitchen, which was just behind a wall facing the room I was in. It wasn't a full wall, with the top not touching the ceiling, so I could smell and hear something cooking. I walked into the kitchen expecting to see Lisa making some normal food, and planning on asking Lisa why Danny was acting weird but what I saw was unforgettable. She's standing in the kitchen, butas naked, covered in blood, cooking some kind of mangled mess, surrounded by thousands of bones. I was just smart enough to notice a pile of motherfucking collars in the corner. Though not until after I intentionally remembered this at home, fucking pet collars. I yelled and Danny lunged at me. I kind of sidestepped away from him clumsily and ran out the door. Danny gave chase and I got to the car and noped the fuck as fast as my little blazer could go. I got home, called the police, gave them the address, and went straight to my dad. He punched me in the face and told me he overheard the address. I tried to apologize and he yelled at me, so I yelled at him for lying to me, so he hit me again, then hugged me and said he was sorry. I tried to ask him but he, rather strongly, told me to shut the fuck up and forget about it. The police came to my house and told me they didn't find anyone living there, but that my story matched the description and the place was a fucking nightmare. They told me they suspected the previous owners left and a mixture of wild animals and burgling homeless people had been living there. My dad, being the fucking ridiculous genius he is, asked why the house hadn't been foreclosed or bill payments hadn't been an issue. The cops stammered then said they'd look into it. Apparently Danny's father had still been paying for it all, as per some agreement when they got married, I still haven't seen them since, and my dad only once told me the story beforehand. My meeting up with them was pure coincidence, and only made the story worse. 
A couple years after all that happened me dad told me the story, got drunk and in his drunken stupor that night told me he knew what would happen to Danny. He knew what they were. Better him than my dad. Be me. Be little kid. Was staying at my dad's place, parents are divorced. Be playing outside. Springtime but still relatively cold outside. Walk around the playground in front of my dad's home. See pale white kid with a greenish hue in the 13 14 years old age range in a dark crimson jacket with plain black shirt underneath. Kid had pointy hair that looks somewhat unnatural and spikes slightly pointing backwards. Kid had very reduced cheeks to almost no cheeks at all and very pointy and above average size teeth. Kid had ridiculously small eyes which were very reflective, almost like diamonds. Kid had overly pronounced eye folds as if he was pushing his eyes shut on purpose. Kid had visible cheek slash jaw muscles and jaw ligaments similar to predatory dinosaurs. Kid had this inhuman grin on his face, very tiny ears and stood there as if he was talking to other people in a conversation but no one was there. Walk past this weird kid at roughly 20 to 21 feet distance. Check this kid out after having passed him. He was now wearing a grey woolen sweater, with his jacket nowhere to be seen, with another kid having appeared out of thin air, talking as if they were there the whole time. I walked by even further, took a close look back at the kid down from the end of the block. He was once again wearing a crimson red jacket, but of a different design than the first one. Other guy is suddenly gone too. Look away. Look back again. Two more guys who looked roughly 19 years old and somewhat overweight have appeared in like 3 seconds max and all three of them were significantly closer now. They were all staring and facing at me with the weird kid in the middle, still grinning. The kid was once again wearing a grey sweater. Run to my dad's home seriously freaked out. Hear an inhuman scream somewhere behind me. My dad had just opened the door and heard it too. Dad claimed he saw me constantly looking behind me, me getting freaked out and what he described as a sentient, moving heat haze following me. I have now translated my account into a green text, and I'm ready to hear possible explanations. Be me, 14, living in Elkin, North Carolina. Older brother Tyler is 16. We're close. We had a whole lot of woods behind our property, it went on for a while. Christmas break, all the trees are dead, the ground is really thick with leaves. We go out for a walk like we often do. We don't talk because we can't hear each other over the crunching of the leaves. We get to this creek which may or may not be deep into someone else's private property, we're not sure. It's not very deep but a few yards wide, sandy creek bed, leaf clumps by the banks. We are about 15 feet from the water. Tyler is balancing on a rotting log talking, I'm standing nearby. Windless, chilly, overcast sky and I suddenly felt uneasy before anything even happened. Then there's a noise across the creek like a footstep. Tyler stops talking. The noise comes back and we see some leaves kick up, other side of the creek. It's like a little puff of leaves just kind of explode upward a little, with a crunching sound you'd expect. Hard to describe I know. It keeps happening across the creek, with maybe like two seconds between crunches. Each crunch is a few feet away from the last. There's some animal over there playing in the leaves says Tyler. A mouse, probably, that's routinely jumping for some reason, but it's also somehow covering a lot of ground between jumps. Crunch crunch. The crunching comes toward us, in a line, reaches the creek. Silence. We watch the far bank to see what it is. Seconds pass. A crunch on our side. I think it's gotta be a wind vortex or something. My heart is pounding, haven't moved. Crunch. I'm staring at the spot really looking for something in the leaves. Crunch. Tyler is gone. My heart stops. He's gone, he's vanished, he's not on the log or anywhere. He was there one second ago. There is nowhere to hide with all the leafless skinny trees, and if he touched the ground at all, even really far away, I would hear it. I can't stress enough how there's no way he could have disappeared that quickly. He's been taken. Crunch right in front of me. I'm running. 
I have no idea if the thing is still chasing me, run for my life back home. My chest is killing me but I cannot stop running, have never been this scared. I'm looking around wildly for Tyler, he is not anywhere, I should have seen him. Get to my backyard where my mom and Tyler are both waiting for me. He's alive. They look terrified, asking what happened and I can't even breath enough to explain, my lungs are frozen. Tyler says you disappeared. A lot of confusion. Apparently his account is that the crunching stopped right when the thing crossed the creek, I remember a few more crunches on our shore, and that I had vanished and he had freaked out and ran. I insisted that he disappeared first and then I ran. They had been waiting for me for a full minute, according to Tyler and mom. What? That timeline makes no sense, why was I that slow getting back? Mom says we both got spooked and ran at the same time, but that still doesn't explain how he got back so fast. Lots of talk. She gets pretty worried about us because of how freaked out we were. We go inside and get warm, I take a shower to clear my head. Me and Tyler talk about this non-stop for months. It becomes a whole thing where we finally built up the courage to return to the creek half a year later, but we don't find anything. I don't tell a lot of people, and I gradually start downplaying how scary it was to my friends that I did tell. Very emotionally scarring. Very strange. Moved a few years later. Michael and I will still reminisce, we wonder if we imagined it sometimes. I have no idea what happened, and as far as I know nothing like that has happened to anyone. If any of you ghost experts or demonologists have theories I would be happy to hear them. I'm going to repost a story I shared in a Mexican stories thread because it fits the theme here. This story was sent to me over a year ago, and I green texted it to share on 4chan. Note, I'm not great at green text. Anyway, the story itself is very bizarre, and I'm not sure if you will enjoy it, but I did. Mom's family is mixed to low race. We don't usually interact with our indigenous family because we live in California and they live in Oaxaca. Turning 15 years old, I go out to spend a month in Oaxaca with my grandpa and my family. Grandpa is a native guy, and he's hunted all his life. He's also an excellent tracker. He decides he wants to take me hunting even though I've never even used a gun before. Shows me how to shoot before we leave so that I'm not entirely clueless. Fast forward a couple hours. Grandpa and I are deep into the Oxican forest. We hear a noise. Grandpa can't identify it. He pauses, listening. Tells me to walk until I'm about 50 meters ahead of him and then stop. Says it will help us locate where the sound is coming from, I don't know I've never hunted. Nervous, but kind of excited too. I move slowly, deeper and deeper into the forest, as quietly as I can. Suddenly a deep fog rolls in, and I mean deep, it's everywhere. Not sure what to do, so I just keep going. After walking the 50 meters as instructed, I squat behind some bushes and wait. And wait. After a bit, I call out, Grandpa. No response. Kind of starting to panic a bit, thinking maybe he lost me. Just then an owl swoops in. A big white adult owl, startles the fuck out of me. I should also mention here that I'm terrified of owls and always have been. I've been attacked by two. Once when I was a baby and once when I was ten. I have a huge scar on my scalp from where it attacked me, and I lost a piece of my lip. Owl lands on a nearby branch. Cue my fear of owls. I start freaking out. I hear my grandpa's voice just then. Anon. I stand up, quickly. Grandpa. He doesn't respond, just keeps calling my name. His voice is getting closer though. The owl starts moving around on the branch, shifting from side to side like it's agitated. Hear grandpa's voice call out again, but this time I notice it sounds weird. Feeling seriously spooked now, I decide to stay hidden in the bushes. Grandpa's voice keeps getting closer. Suddenly it's really close, and I see something step through the bushes. But the fog is super dense, can't really make it out at first. 
I can only tell that it's some type of animal. Keep watching it until finally I can make it out. It's a taper, pick related. Feel myself overwhelmed with fear for some reason. I almost feel like crying. The taper raises its head like it's sniffing the air. But then it opens its mouth. Anon. I'm getting uneasy here just writing this. Instantly think about shooting this thing, but I'm still pretty useless with a gun. The taper gets closer. By this point the owl is making all sorts of noises, sounds like it's squealing. Taper looks over at the owl and calls my name again. The owl stops squealing all at once and locks eyes with me for a moment. Suddenly it dives down and begins to claw at the taper's eyes. Blood is flying everywhere. It's dark black, almost like Chinese ink. That's enough for me, I take off running. I can hear the taper start chasing after me, but it sounds like the owl is still attacking it. The taper is still calling my name but the voice sounds different now, really high pitched. I hear a loud crunch. Look back as I'm running, the taper has the owl in its jaws. Suddenly Grandpa is is rushing over to me. Stay on the ground. He yells. He shoots at the taper, lands two bit shots, black ink blood going everywhere, but the animal won't go down. Its voice gets even louder, Grandpa keeps shooting. Taper finally turns and runs into the forest. Grandpa checks on me and then we go over to where the taper got shot two bullet on the ground there, covered in blood. Grandpa says the taper wasn't an animal. He picks up the body of the white owl and says, this wasn't an animal either. He tells me it was a relative of ours, but he's gone now. I cried on the way back home and Grandpa told everyone what happened. The family held a little ritual for the dead owl, and Grandpa showed me a framed photograph of his brother. He said that it was his brother who was controlling the owl, it was him who saved me. I never went back to fucking Oaxaca. Well it isn't nearly as impressive as the any skinwalker tales but it's my only true paranormal experience, sorry if it turns out a bit boring. Be sophomores in high school. Me, my mother, and friend are all going camping and rappelling. Place we are going rappelling is Moaning Caverns CA, so we found a nearby campsite to stay a few days at too. We get a spot on the outer edge of the campsite, next to where the forests start. After setting up and stuff on Friday me and friend decide to go exploring. Not much time, sun is going down, but we find an old abandoned water storage and decide to call it a day. Before we go I notice that the hill next to us flattens up at the top, I feel drawn to it for some reason. Saturday. We go rappelling, barrels of fun enjoyed messing with my friend on the way down since I'd already done the rappel once as a boy scout. Get back to camp, first thing we do is go up that hill. As we reach the top where it flattens out friend freezes. That's a witch's circle dude. What's a witch's circle? A circle of trees that all point away from the center, supposed to be magical and shit. My friend goes on, tells me he's getting these weird vibes, last time he had M an axe nearly fell on his head. Whereas I'm completely oblivious, really into stuff like this so I'm just running around the place super excited. Notice that at the other side of the hill opposite of where we came in the forest gets thicker and more hilly. See a large decaying stump so I hop onto it to get a better look. As I look around I get this weird feeling crawling over me. Suddenly this feeling turns into a sound. Very faint, can't make it out at all but I can hear it in my head, or maybe it's right next to my ear sound gets louder and louder till I can make out exactly what it is. It's a little girl humming. I turn back to my friend who had apparently been calling me this whole time. He shuts the hell up as soon as he sees my face. Later he tells me I looked like I was about to either run like hell or run up and stab him. I actually do charge up to him but start panicking and tell him we gotta get the hell out of here. He tells me to calm down and we walk back to the campsite and leave the next morning. Now the eerie part of this is, when we were heading down I realized that the way I was about to run before my friend told me to calm the hell down, wasn't the way back. I could have sworn it was, but it would have just taken me deep into the herd of the forest, where I'd be lost and completely fucked. Got this one saved from a thread from I can only assume 2015. The year is 2009. Just graduated from high school, 
It's September now and me and my three best friends were all accepted into the same school school year starts on the 18th so we decide to go on a week long road trip from the 5th to the 12th from our shitty little town in Oregon to San Francisco and back. Friends are Eddie, Trevor, and Marco. Everything's going fine on the first day moods are high, Eddie's high, we're all having fun. What could possibly go wrong? Well, announce reading this, here's what went wrong, everything. Dramatic as that is, it's true. It started on day two when we were a little over halfway to San Fran. We stopped through a small town called Eureka to have lunch. After that we continued driving, and Trevor noticed Marco was looking a little ill. He said it was fine though, so we continued our drive. The trip was supposed to be a 13-hour drive spread over two days, but we never made it to San Fran. I started to get an unsettling feeling in my stomach when the sun was starting to set and we still weren't in San Fran. In fact, we weren't even close. We did stop earlier in the day to take a few photos of the ocean, but it didn't take that long. Eddie was the one in control of the wheel now and heaved a heavy sigh of relief when a sign finally read, entering Santa Rosa. Great, we were almost there. Another four hours passed and we still weren't in San Fran. We were on the correct highway going in the correct direction, but we weren't getting anywhere. What's more, looking back on it, I hadn't seen a single car on the highway after 7 p.m. Not a single one. We'd seen them in the towns, but not with us. It was 1 a.m. when we officially were freaking out. We stopped at this little hotel to stay in and asked where we were. Uh, this is Lakeport. Lakeport? Before we could start yelling at Eddie for fucking up, Trevor was suddenly met with the weight of Marco collapsing on him, which wasn't much, considering Marco was a 5 feet 6 102 pounds semi-anorexic guy. We contemplated calling 911 but he muttered, I'm fine, just sleepy, and then thoroughly passed out. It was about 3 am when I heard absolutely awful noises coming from our room's bathroom. Like a cat being strangled. I remembered Marco looking ill and assumed he was just puking from food poisoning, but being the person I am I had to go give him comfort. I opened the door, and, nothing. Marco wasn't there, the light was on, but all there was was, blood? Why was there blood on the floor? Was Marco alright? Am I hallucinating? Well, turns out, I wasn't, but I made the grave mistake of assuming I was and going back to sleep. Was awakened by Eddie three hours later, asking why there was blood on the bathroom floor and where the hell Marco was. We all got up and asked the receptionist if he'd seen him, but to no avail. Panic was rising as fast as Eddie's blood pressure was. We called the cops and they said they'd send someone over, but no one ever came. We called again an hour later, and nothing. So, we went back to sleep. Marco was there in the morning, looking like shit but he was alive and that's what mattered. But something was off. He was crying into Trevor's shoulder talking about the Anga that tried to rape and murder him. He claimed he was taken suddenly after getting up to go to the bathroom. One could have easily assumed he was just on drugs, but Marco was straight edge to the T. He was a pranker though, but even more than that, he wasn't lying. We could tell by the fear in his eyes. It may sound kind of gay but when he clung tightly to Trevor all that day, physically holding his hand while looking like an abandoned kitten, we knew something had happened. After double checking that yes, we were going in the right direction, we set off for San Fran and told Marco to forget his worries he couldn't. He kept his eyes closed the entire time because he was terrified of looking at the forest. An hour in and he suddenly opened the car door while the car was in motion to puke out black and red bile. And it was a lot. More than what I thought could fit in that tiny body of his. An hour after that, we read a sign that said, Saratoga Springs. Eddie sighed and handed the wheel over to me. We turned the car around. Another hour and the sign read Upper Lake. We were getting increasingly frustrated. Marco was shivering violently in the back seat with his head rested on Trevor's lap. Every 10 minutes or so he would vomit into one of the many plastic bags kept there. Another hour, another headache. Saratoga Springs was the sign, and so this time we decided to not turn around. Another hour. Upper Lake. No matter what direction we drove in, we were stuck between these two towns. And going by the Google Maps calculations of today, 
this shouldn't have taken us an hour to drive that road. For reference, it should have taken us six minutes. Six. Minutes. Marco was looking increasingly worse as we drove, and it all came crashing down when he suddenly demanded I pull over and so I did. Marco threw himself at the ground and vomited up what seemed to be an endless stream of blood. Then came pieces of meat. Flesh. And then came nothing. We called 911. Nobody came. We called over and over. Someone finally picked up. Nobody came. Marco began bleeding from his fingernails, eyeballs, nose, ears, and belly button. He was unresponsive so Trevor tried CPR. It didn't work. The smell was rancid. Nobody came. No cars were around. Marco died that day. We watched in tears as the last breath exited his lungs. We piled him into the car and drove to Upper Lake. An autopsy was performed and we told his parents. We went back home the next day, all convinced the road would lead us to Saratoga Springs. It didn't. There were cars on the road. We were making proper time. We arrived home. Four years later and his grave was dug up by an unidentified person slash animal. His skull was found on the grounds of Upper Lake Elementary School, but the rest of his body wasn't. A triangle had been carved into it. I had to go to San Fran this year for a job opportunity. Trevor and Eddie went with me. We never stopped in that diner, never looked back, never looked at the street signs. We got there when we prayed we would. I don't remember Eddie having heterochromia. I don't recall Trevor's voice sounding that way. All I know is that when I saw fresh blood of a dead doe on the side of the road, I screamed for an hour straight.